All right, we're getting ready for the next talk, and that is iterated inhomogeneous polynomials. And this is going to be given by video, and the authors are Jiajin Guang and Mark Jandri. All right, let's get started. My name is Zhang Xingguan, and today I'll be talking about our failure, iterated inhomogeneous polynomials. This is a joint failure with Mark Zandri, both of us are from Princeton University and NTD Research. I've noticed that a lot of the other talks have rather interesting titles, but it's sort of too late to change ours. So I guess instead, today, we'll be talking about iterating homogeneous polynomials, iterating homogeneous polynomials, iterating homogeneous polynomials, so on and so forth. Oh, you know, it's iterated. So just as every good story begins with, once upon a time, Mark was back at home just casually browsing the mathematics section of Stack Exchange when a specific post caught his interest. A few days later, Mark talked to me about the post during our meeting and later on sent me the link in the email. So this is the email I received from Mark. And what is this exact post that caught Mark's interest? Well, the original post is on triangular numbers, namely fx equals x times x plus one over two. However, instead of evaluating this function over the integers, it is evaluated mod two to the n. So what are some interesting properties here? So first of all, it is pointed out in the post that this actually forms a permutation of the elements in z two to the n. And secondly, now that we know that f of x is a permutation, we know that if we start from x and we keep on applying the function f iteratively, eventually we will get bad x get back at x. So a natural question would be, how long would these cycles be? Well, it turns out that from the post, empirically, empirically these cycles are really long. And in a follow-up to the post, it's actually proved that for sufficiently large n, the longest cycle is actually at least 2 to the n over 10. So why does these triangular numbers interest us? As some of you might have already noticed that in the, the title of the email is actually VDFs. So what are VDFs? VDF stands for Verifiable Delay Functions. The concept was first put forward by Bonnet, Bonnell, Bunz, and Fish in 2018. We won't go into the full formal definition of VDFs today, but roughly speaking, the definition has two components. First of all, the function itself needs to be a sequential function, meaning that it is slow to compute even for an app stream with levels of parallelism. Secondly, while you are computing a function, you should also be able to compute a short proof, which will allow others to efficiently verify the output of the function. There are a couple of known constructions of VDFs. Two of them are from repeated squaring, done by Wesolowski and Peter Zak separately in 2018. There is also a construction from isogenies from DeFeo and others but that one is less relevant to our talk today. So both of these uh, Wisolowski and Peter's X constructions use repeated squaring as the sequential function. Namely, you start, so you start from X, compute X squared, X to the fourth, so on and so forth, all the way until X to the two to the T. What is different in these papers is that uh, they produce different proofs, both using some algebraic properties of repeated squaring. So here's an interesting way to view these, uh, these sequential functions. If we think about f of x being the squaring function, this, re uh, this repeated squaring procedure is actually just iteratively applying the function f on the input x. So a natural question is, is squaring the only function f here? Can we use some other function, for example, maybe the triangular number? Well, it turns out that with triangular numbers, there are two problems. The first issue is this divide by two operation. It is not commutative with the mod operation. For example, if we start with the number 18 and we divide by two first and then mod by 16, the result is gonna be nine. However, if we swap the order of these operations and we perform the mod operation before the divide by two operation, the result would now be one. So this breaks the nice algebraic property of this function f. Recall that both Wesolowski and Peter's X proofs are algebraic proofs. They both take advantage of the algebraic properties of the underlying repeated squaring. 
Therefore, if we were to replace repeated squaring with this f, neither of Peterzak nor uh, Wesolowski's proofs will work. Therefore, we will need to come up with some other clever proof here. The second issue is that although we know there exist long cycles, uh, chances are that if we pick a random starting point x, uh, chances are that we're still stuck in a fixed point or a very short cycle. It is just not quite satisfying yet. So the natural question here would be, are there any polynomials that actually give us full length cycles? It seems that the idea of triangular numbers from the stack exchange post doesn't quite work. So we naturally move on to the next chapter where we try to search for a polynomial that we can use as a sequential function. So some of the day, Ki Pan Liu, aka Kevin, who is also a student of Mark, is at my place having lunch. Uh, for lunch, we were actually having hot pot. And we were talking about uh, the post Mark sent me, and I was talking about how we're, able, how, how we're searching for a polynomial that gives us full length cycles. So Kevin accidentally rubbed his hand against the hot pot with boiling water in there. And surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, out comes a hot pot genie. So the genie was obviously quite grumpy because he was disturbed from his sleep. Uh, but nevertheless, he's a genie and he said that we can, we can ask three wishes, but since he was grumpy, he may or may not fulfill them. Since we were just talking about this problem, naturally, Kevin asked, are there any polynomials that gives us full length cycles? So the genie thought for a while and said, yes, actually there are. One example of such polynomials is fx is equal to 2x squared plus 3x plus 1. Uh, here we're modeling 16 here because it's easier to demonstrate, but actually it works mod any larger 2 to the n. So let's say we start from uh, 1, so we pick x equal to 1, and then we compute f of 1, which is equal to 6, so we go to 6, and from 6 to 11, to 4, to 13, so on and so forth, and we can see that as we're going, we went through all of the 16 elements and got back to 1. And in fact, we're able to prove that this function f actually gives us full then cycles mod 2 to the n. In addition to that, we're also to be able to, uh, to, to generalize this into a general form uh, parameterized by three integers k, l, and m. And the function is 2kx squared plus 4l plus 2k plus 1 times x plus 2m plus 1. This whole thing is also full, full, uh, gives us full length cycles mod any 2 to the n. So the properties here, if you take a look, is that the constant coefficient is uh, need to be odd, and the quadratic coefficient needs to be even, and the difference between the linear coefficient and the quadratic coefficient needs to be 1 mod 4. We're also able to uh, get a proof that these polynomials uh, get full length cycles. So the genie fulfilled our first wish and gave us a polynomial, or actually a class of polynomials that give us full length cycles. And Kevin went back home after the lunch, of course, and he had other researchers to attend to, but I was stuck with the genie at my home because he wouldn't leave until all the three wishes are made. Therefore, the next question is, what wish should I make next? Well, um, we wanted to replace repeated squaring by iterative polynomials, right? And uh, they we can view repeated squaring in this way. So we have this g of x is the squaring function, and they're evaluated over this group of unknown order. And we want, uh, we want that x to the 2 to the t, which is essentially this function evaluated t times, it should require uh, approximately a linear amount of sequential time to compute. This uh, is actually proved, uh, this is actually proved in the black box ring model by Rodem and Segev in 2020. So uh, the question is, if we were to replace this gx with f of x, which is 2 squared plus 3x plus 1, and it is evaluated over 2 to the n instead of uh, a group of unknown order, is this statement still true? Is f of uh, f iterated t times on x still require uh, a linear amount of time to compute? So I asked the genie this question. 
the genie thought for a while and said, no. Nope. Actually, computing f iterate t times on x, you can do that in time much shorter than, uh, than linear. So how do we do this? So the first thing to notice is that take this falling factorial of x. You multiply x with x minus 1 all the way until x minus k plus 1. Uh, that's k terms in total. So the first thing is that by basic combinatorics, this is a uh, multiple of k factorial. And then if we set the value of k to be high enough, roughly somewhere around n, this k factorial will also contain 2 to the n as a factor. Therefore, this falling factorial of degree k contains 2 to the n as a factor. That means this falling factorial of degree k is identically 0 mod 2 to the n. What this allows us to do is that take any function of a potential very high degree, and what we can do is to look at its highest degree and then subtract out a falling factorial of the corresponding degree. This will make the highest degree go away, but this will not change the value of the function because what we're subtracting out is identically zero mod two to the n. So by repeating this process, we're eventually able to reduce this polynomial of a high degree to a polynomial that has a degree at most k minus one. And of course, the new, uh, the new polynomial will have different coefficients. And since this has a bounded degree, we can represent this polynomial as a vector v of length k multiplied by the transposition of a Vandermonde matrix of only one row and degree k as well. So now let's assume that we've already computed f iterated i times on input x and it is represented by the vector v multiplied by the transposition of the Vandermonde. We want to show how we can use this to compute the next iteration, which is namely f iterated i plus one times on x. Notice that we can separate this into two parts where we first evaluate f once on input x and then followed by another i iterations. We can expand out, we can expand out this and this will give us b0 plus b1 times f of x plus b2 times f of x squared all the way to b k minus one times f of x raised up to the power of k minus one. The next thing we do is to collect the coefficients of this polynomial. So what is the new constant coefficient? Well, that is just by summing up all of the old coefficients, namely b0 plus b1 plus b2 all the way to b k minus one. Um, the linear coefficient is gonna be slightly more complicated but nevertheless, it is still a linear combination of the O coefficients. And so it's, and it's also true for the quadratic coefficient all the way to the coefficient for the highest degree. In this case, it is 2K minus two. So the next thing we do, so now we have a polynomial with degree 2K minus two. We want to reduce it to a polynomial of highest degree K minus one using the falling factorial trick from the previous page. Notice that this trick, we iteratively subtract out falling factorials from the highest degree, and this procedure is strictly linear. Therefore, the new, uh, the new coefficients that we get for the, for, the, for the new polynomial, which has a degree at most k minus one, all these coefficients are again a linear combination of the old coefficients of f iterated i times on x. Therefore, we can represent these new coefficients as a linear transformation on the original on the original coefficients, and we can represent this linear transformation as this matrix M, which has dimension k by k. Therefore, f iterated i plus one times on the input x can be simply written as the original uh, coefficient vector b multiplied by the transformation matrix M, and then multiplied by the transposition of the Vandermonde. Notice that this uh, transformation matrix M is independent of I. It is only dependent on the original polynomial 2x squared plus 3x plus 1, uh, which makes it, that makes it the same even for different I's. Then by simple induction, we know that the function f iterated t times on the input x is just uh, the unit vector representing x multiplied by the transformation matrix M raised up to the T times multiplied by the transposition of the vendor. And how long does it take to compute this? 
Well, we can uh, use uh, repeated squaring to compute this uh, m raised up to the t, and that will only require log t time, which is much faster than the supposedly linear runtime. Therefore, we have shown there is actually a way to shortcut these iterative polynomial evaluations. Well, this is not exactly bad news for us. We now know that computing f iterated t times on input x can be done efficiently. We can perhaps use this as a group action. So if we look at a group generated by iteratively applying the function f, uh, this group actually has a smooth order of 2 to the n. This means that uh, discrete log within this group is easy. However, discrete log within the group actions could still potentially be hard. Also, just as we've seen in isogeny-based cryptography, group actions can be hoped to be quantum resistant. Therefore, there is certain interest in studying whether we can use these polynomials as group actions. So here's a Diffie-Hellman protocol that uses these polynomials as uh, group actions. So for Alice and Bob to reach a uh, common secret, they will first agree on a function f together with an input f. These are made public and everybody has access to it. In fact, you cannot even think about x being simply one. So Alice was, ha, would think about a secret value a and evaluate the function f a times on input x and Bob similarly for a secret value b. And then Alice and Bob will exchange their evaluations of the function and Alice will again evaluate the function another a times on Bob's result and eventually got this a result which is equivalent to the function evaluating the function f b times and then a times on the input x. Bob will also get a similar result and it is easy to verify that both of these results are equal to f iterated a plus b times on the input x. So having lived with the hot pot genie in my room for a couple of months I kind of really want to get rid of him so therefore I ask the last wish is discrete log within the group actions hard in this case? So in order to be specific, we're given the function f and input x, and we're given the result of evaluating the function f t times on the input x. Can we uh, get from here the, the number of iterations t? So Gini thought for a while and actually said, nope, that is not hard at all. So here's how the genie proposed that we solve the discrete log within the group actions. So we start from the input x and the function evaluated t times on the input x. And then we simultaneously evaluate the function f on both of these values and we repeat this for a while. Now by the commutativity of uh, polynomial composition, we know that uh, it doesn't matter if you apply the function f t times first or one time first, the result is the same. So now we're able to replace the bottom half of the chain with these values instead. The next thing to notice is that since f presents full length cycles, we know that f of x is not going to be the same as x. Let's say we call it x prime, and similarly x double prime, x triple prime, and we updated the values in the bottom correspondingly as well. What this gives us are actually pairs of values that are different points on the function f iterated t times. Then the next step, we use polynomial interpolation to get back the polynomial f iterated t times. Here we're doing the polynomial uh, interpolation in z2 to the n. It is a bit trickier, but nonetheless, it is still possible. So now we're able to map from the group actions back to the group elements, and since the group itself has a smooth order of 2 to the n, solving the discrete log and getting t is easy. So now that we've made all our three wishes, the Hotpot Genie disappeared without a trace. So looking back at our story, the first wish we made was for polynomials with full n cycles. The Genie kindly granted the wish and actually gave us a class of polynomials with full length cycles. The second wish we made was for no shortcutting on iterated evaluation of polynomials. However, the genie declined our wish and showed us that uh, you can shortcut by squaring these transformation matrices. The third wish that we made was that 
we want to use these polynomials as group actions, so we wonder if discrete log is hard for these group actions. Again, the Hotbaugini declined our wish and shows that we can map these group actions back to the group elements where the discrete log becomes easy. So, to prepare for the next time that we meet the Hotbaugini, we want some wishes ready by hand, and here are some of them. First, we notice that the group of polynomials mod 2 to the n is non-abelian, and we wonder if we can plug this into non-abelian crypto systems. Secondly, most of the currently, uh, current protocols rely on the hardness of the discrete log problem. But here we have a uh, group where uh, both the discrete log within the group and within the group actions are easy. We wonder if there are any interesting protocols that we can build utilizing this easy discrete log problems. And lastly, Perhaps by embedding addition and multiplication into polynomial addition and composition, we might be able to get some form of fully homomorphic encryption. This seems like an interesting idea to explore. Lastly, thank you all for your time, and we hope that you meet a hot dog genie sometime in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you. Very nicely done. All right. Do you have any questions for the speaker or the hotpot genie? I don't see any on, on Zulip yet. So do you think you should have asked the first question differently? Or do you have evidence that all other polynomials that are not squaring and have a full cycle length are easy to evaluate? Uh, so you're saying that, uh, can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. So the question is, can you ask the genie a question to give you something of full cycle length, which is not easy to shortcut? Uh, yeah, that's what we've been uh, trying to find. And uh, it seems um, seems hard because all the polynomials that we've come up with, um, I think the issue is that if they give you full length cycles, um, our intuition is that it's like the, the polynomial, uh, if you look at the cycles itself, it's, it's actually well structured which essentially pre presents you like uh, some way of shortcutting it. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but that's an interesting question to think about. Maybe not multi to the end, maybe uh, in, some other, um, in some other groups or range. So yeah, that's definitely one direction to explore. See more people coming up on this camera. Anybody has a question? Everybody is saving a question to ask the genie, genie directly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wonder how I can invoke that genie because I mean, <laughs> hot pot sounds awesome to begin with. Do you have to have special brand of hot pot, or can it be your homemade? Uh, it's just the trick that you just need. It's just like the technique you need, like to rub the hot pot in a special way. I guess like Keepan, who's I think also in the talk, he might have more experience in that. <laughs> no, but don't actually try that. That's uh, you. You'll get burned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry maybe i didn't get that so why did you choose is there any reason to choose two to the end in the first place so uh it's sort of like we started off uh, with this pose and where they study triangular numbers mod two to the end and that's sort of like uh, so we started from there and we look at all different polynomials mod two to the uh, mod two to the end so that's sort of where we started uh so we've actually looked at higher degree polynomials for example, uh, say of degree three, uh, say for example, fx equals say, uh, I don't remember exactly, but say some uh, degree three polynomial. And in that case, you will be doing mod three to the n uh, in that case. And that will also give you full n cycle. Because it seems like the more structure you have, maybe the easier the problem or like, um, no, because this, okay, maybe this uh, designate, this, um, Verifiable delay function, they are modulo. Yeah, they're right? in groups of unknown order, but they're like, they're doing the squaring, um, which gives you full end cycles. But if you uh, if you do these polynomials within uh, within groups of unknown order, uh, they're not gonna be, they're not gonna give you full end cycles. Uh, the full end cycles are only there in the, if you're doing mod two to the end with these polynomials. Okay, thank you. All right, at this point it's quarter past, so I should hand over to Alison. But let me first thank uh, 
to Jan for the awesome talk and lots of hot pot inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ellie, do you want to check real quick that we can hear you before I introduce your talk?